Welcome back. As we saw in the first half of this two-part series, the Roman Empire seemed, at least at a cursory glance, to be primed for industrialization. Trade flourished, consumer goods were produced in enormous quantities, and scholars tinkered with steam-powered devices. Yet nothing like the Industrial Revolution that transformed 18th century Britain ever took place. Technological change, as we'll see, does not occur spontaneously when a society reaches a certain level of prosperity and technical knowledge. It needs to be stimulated by a clear need or opportunity. Lacking that, and lacking entrepreneurs motivated to invest in new technologies, the Romans were never destined for an industrial revolution, televised or otherwise. Take, for example, Hero of Alexandria's famous Eolopile. As discussed in the first video, this was a primitive turbine featuring a hollow metal sphere spun by steam escaping from two angled vents. The Eolopile was too inefficient to ever be developed into a practical power source, which is hardly surprising, since there's no evidence that Hero intended it to be anything of the sort. Had he wanted to create a steam engine, Hero likely could have done so. It simply never occurred to him that such a device was worth making. Hero was a product of a society in which technological innovation, though sometimes welcomed, at least when it offered the elite new ways to make money, had a limited place. The Ptolemies had supported a few mechanically inclined scholars at the Library of Alexandria, and one of them, the brilliant Tisibius, had rewarded their patronage by inventing the force pump, the hydraulic organ, and the first accurate water clock. This sort of state-financed research and development, however, was virtually non-existent in the Roman world. Most members of the Roman elite saw no reason to encourage mechanical experimentation. They tended, like the Greeks before them, to regard such things as unworthy of an educated gentleman's attention, what Plato and Aristotle had called bonosic. This disdain is neatly summarized in the passage from Seneca excerpted here. We know that certain devices have been invented within our own memory, such as windows that admit clear light through transparent panes, and vaulted baths with pipes let into their walls for the purpose of diffusing heat. All this sort of thing has been devised by the lowest grade of slaves. Wisdom's seat is higher. She trains not the hands, but is mistress of our minds. Although such snobbery was far from universal, it reflected what seems to have been a generally cautious attitude toward innovation. According to an anecdote repeated by several ancient authors, the Emperor Tiberius once destroyed the workshop of a craftsman who developed a flexible form of glass, fearing that it would reduce the value of gold and silver. Vespasian, likewise, was said to have rejected a new device for lifting columns, since he wished to keep the Roman commoners employed. Although it's unlikely that either story has basis in fact, both are characteristic of a culture that did not necessarily regard technological progress as positive. In addition, thanks to poor communications, a machine or method developed in one part of the empire had no guarantee of reaching the rest of the Roman world. The famous Antikythera mechanism, an elaborate astronomical clock sometimes described as the first analog computer, is the only device of its kind ever discovered. Knowledge of how to create machines like it was probably limited to a small circle of craftsmen on the island of Rhodes, and never spread into the wider empire. On the theoretical side, a serious impediment was the nature of Greco-Roman higher education, which emphasized the practice of rhetoric and close reading of classical texts. The conservative nature of this training encouraged those few students who contrived to be interested in mechanics and the physical sciences to refine the work of their great predecessors instead of pioneering new lines of research. More fundamentally, even if Greco-Roman culture had privileged technological innovation, there was no economic incentive to pursue anything like the industrial ventures that transformed Britain in the 18th century. This is not the place to enter the ongoing academic debate over the nature of the Roman economy, which centers on the embeddedness of economic activity in ancient social structures and attitudes. For our purposes, it matters only that the Roman economy, despite real sophistication in certain respects, was underdeveloped. Most of the population lived near the subsistence level, 
and the vast majority of all wealth, was held by a small landed aristocracy. Commerce was mostly localized, and industry was mostly small-scale. The British Industrial Revolution was initially stimulated by the cotton textile industry, which awarded spectacular profits to entrepreneurs who pursued the most efficient methods of mass-producing cloth. Though his profits were made possible by a large international market and by financial institutions that facilitated large-scale investment in new technologies, nothing in the Roman economy enabled or repaid such investment. As we have seen, there were a few examples of what could be called mass production in the Roman world. But these were exceptional for the simple reason that the Roman market for mass-produced consumer goods was vastly smaller than the global market that made British cotton cloth so profitable in the late 18th century. The majority of Romans, after all, were poor farmers with little disposable income. And in any case, the difficulties and expense of transport made marketing manufactured goods cost ineffective almost anywhere outside a major city. Even if there had been a more promising market for mass-produced manufactures, the Roman world lacked a class of entrepreneurs ready to exploit it. The Roman elite sometimes invested in industrial enterprises, such as the brickyards that many landowners around Rome established in their estates. These, however, invariably produced basic and inexpensive goods that did not drive any kind of technological innovation. Nor did they create a separate entrepreneurial class since the slaves and contractors who managed them had to surrender most of their profits to aristocratic owners. In any case, the Roman elite's engagement in manufacturing was always opportunistic. Wealthy men preferred to invest in land, the ancient world's most reliable asset, or in some combination of money lending and luxury commerce, which were far more lucrative than any manufacturing enterprise known to the Romans. And instead of reinvesting their profits in business ventures, they tended to pour them into lavish villas, extravagant banquets, and other forms of conspicuous consumption. Although there were prosperous merchants and freedmen outside the traditional aristocracy, these outsiders never formed a distinct group, and the wealthiest among them imitated the attitudes and investing habits of the elite. Unlike 18th century Britain, in short, the Roman world had neither a class of entrepreneurs ready to invest in innovative technologies nor any industry that rewarded such investment. British society had been primed for industrialization by a host of factors, ranging from a history of coal mining to a growing population of landless agricultural workers. But the critical catalyst was the emergence of the cotton textile industry, which offered profits on a scale that drove generations of investors into a frenzy of competition and innovation. Nothing remotely comparable existed in ancient Rome. Although we have been conditioned to expect it, technological advance is not inevitable. One invention does not necessarily beget another, and progression is as natural as progress. Nor is technological advance the goal of every society. The Romans' technologies were perfectly adequate for their needs as they perceived them. Their failure to industrialize was not a missed opportunity. In their eyes, there was no opportunity to miss. If you enjoyed this video, please consider supporting Tolton Stone on Patreon. You might also enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.